on this episode of Jeff Does Vegas. Some of those songs would have been when they got divorced or maybe terrible things happened to them. The boyfriend left them or they lost their job or whatever. But they have happy memories for some reason. And that, that 90 minutes has made them happy. They go home happy. And that's why we have a fan base that we've never had. No other show has it. We have more five-star reviews than any other show ever in Vegas. Las Vegas. It's more than just a city. It's a feeling. It's that feeling of excitement when you spot the lights of the strip out the airplane window. It's that feeling of awe as you stroll down the boulevard, taking in the sights and sounds. And it's that feeling of satisfaction knowing that you're in the greatest city in the world. Over 42 million people from around the world share that feeling every year. And I'm one of them. Taking you to the world-famous Vegas Strip and beyond, my name is Jeff, and this is Jeff Does Vegas. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 123 of Jeff Does Vegas. Before we get rolling for this episode of the podcast, I just wanted to thank everyone who took the time to check out the last episode, another world-famous Jeff Does Vegas trip report, chronicling my last visit to Vegas from July 25th to 27th, 2022. We dove into my hotel stay, the restaurants I visited, a very cool tour experience I checked out, and much more. If you haven't listened as of yet, jump into the archives at jeffdoesvegas.com and check out episode number 122, The July Trip Report, or search it out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, here we go. On to the show. Imagine being able to attend a concert featuring some of the greatest rock songs in history from the likes of Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, The Who, The Rolling Stones, The Doors, ACDC, and Van Halen. And those songs are being played by musicians from some of the biggest bands in the world, like Whitesnake, Starship, Slaughter, The Cult, and Heart. Stop imagining it, because it's reality. It's called Raiding the Rock Vault, and it's in Las Vegas. Raiding the Rock Vault has been a part of the Las Vegas entertainment landscape for almost a decade now, having had residencies at the Westgate, formerly the LVH Hotel, the Tropicana, and the Hard Rock Hotel. And the show recently made the move off the strip to the Rio to open up the brand new venue, Duomo. My guest for this episode of the podcast is Raiding the Rock Vault co-creator Sir Harry Cowell. Sir Harry has a long pedigree in the music business, having worked as a drummer, drum tech, and tour manager before eventually opening up his own recording studio and moving into the world of international management and music publishing. Sir Harry and I talked about some of the incredible artists he's worked with over the years, the inspiration behind the creation of Raiding the Rock Vault, and the challenges of moving into a new venue. Please enjoy my conversation with Sir Harry Cowell. My passion really was sport. Um, I'm not the most, most educated person in the world, but sport was my love. And um, I was in all the teams of football and rugby and all those sorts of things um, to a point where I, I entered a school or tried to enter a school. It wasn't particularly difficult, but which was called Millfield, and it's in Somerset in England. And it's a sports school. It's probably, well, without doubt, the, the most famous sports school in the world, end of story. We've had more Olympians come out of there than all the, all the schools put together in the whole of the UK. So I, I got a, a, um, a, a, a scholarship there originally to play major sports, which was cricket, rugby and football. Um, but I couldn't get any of the teams because I realised when I went there that they were, these guys were good. And I was, I was good, but not great, shall we say. And so, but uh, I did find out I was good at rugby and I could run quite fast. So that, that's where my love started. I, I was a runner. Um, 400 metres, I was the fastest in the UK um, at my age, which was 15, 16 years old. And I was very good wing three-quarter, which is on the rugby pitch, where, when the scrum get hold of the ball, they throw, throw it down the line, and you you just run like mad and hope you get tackled. And so that's what I did, basically, um, at school. And, and sports was my thing. My father owned a, sport, a sporting company, 
at the time with a company called Gola, which in the world was the second biggest sports apparel company after Adidas. It was Adidas, Gola, G-O-L-A, and then Puma. And any, any kid in the 70s had a Gola bag and the, the football was sponsored by the Gola League and all that. So it was, that was my sports thing. And my original plan was, was to train up and go into Gola and, and hopefully run it. And uh, I, made, I made an offer to my father to do that. And he said, oh, I said that I thought my father was a very military man. He wasn't military, but he was in the, in the war. And... Um, he said, oh, I don't think sports will ever really be big apart from on the sports field. And I said, no, there's clubs. There's the Bank of England Club and the Harrodian Club, but they're going to be normal clubs. And you make me wear these bloody tennis shoes um, when I wear, just played. But I want to wear them when I, when I don't wear I don't want to wear black shoes. So I don't want to do that. And he said, it'll never catch on. So I said, are you sure? And he said, never, never, not doing it. Not going to get involved in it. So I thought, all right, okay off you go then. and I joined the punk band and um, he sold the company off and then you can see what happened in the sports business it went absolutely well so uh, one of those things my father got slightly got wrong um, so I, I joined a, a, a punk band when I, was, I was at a college called uh, Crawley Tech it was a technical college um, and uh, there was a few friends of mine there it was um, Rob Smith from The Cure Top Tallhurst from The Cure Dempsey was in the bass player in the cure. And so we were all in bands and things, and that's how it started. And uh, I toured a couple with, with a couple of punk bands, and then I got a call from a friend of mine who was going on the road. He said, do you want a job? And I said, what, what are you doing? He said, we well, get paid. Um, I was doing a couple of jobs at the airport, Gary, Gary Airport at the time, to make myself alive. And he said, well, you've got to put the drums up. And cart them around and I said I get paid he said yeah we get, get paid maybe a bit of drugs or whatever <laughs> 79 this was and I said what's the name of the band and he said oh Genesis I said never heard of them <laughs> well, they're, punk, they're a punk band no they're not punk and so I got a job that they're working on the road that was 18 months and then my whole career started from there that's amazing I love that Genesis never heard of them no never idea heard of them. it was just <laughs> after well I hadn't heard of them because I was into more weird stuff more punk stuff I got uh, being a drummer. I, I I did get gobbed at, but it's quite a way to gob at you when you're the drum kit. So I was cleaning the drum kit every night, and the gob all over it. And I thought, well, I get paid, and I'm on the road. So it was a no brainer. But I hadn't heard of them; I had no idea. And it was a tour that it was called. Then there were three, and it was a tour that um, I'm trying to think who left. Rutherford was in, um, Banks was in, Phil Collins in. They had two drummers, obviously. And the other guy had left, who was a guitarist, I can't remember what his name was. He went off. Um, yeah, I can't remember. So then it was basically Gen- Genesis had gone down from five to three, because mm-hmm. obviously Peter Gabriel had also left. So, so then, that, then there were three. And I mean, you've worked with, with amazing bands as well. I mean, you, I, looking over your bio, I mean, The Police, ACDC, Blue Oyster Cult, Ozzy Osbourne. I mean, that's, that's a pretty amazing resume to have. Well, I mean, I work with them as, as long as a lot of other people work with them. I was on the road. Um, it wasn't until a bit later on that I, I started being a tour manager and growing up and being a manager. But, yeah, I learned a lot off it. I mean, one of the, the big, biggest things on the Aussie dates was um, we were somewhere up north or something, and Aussie said, you know, the whole thing about this is you're, you've got to work and make the show enjoyable. And he explained why the people have got – Travels in their what lives and their wives left them or their fathers died, but they're coming and paying good money to come and see me or us or whatever. And for those two hours, they've got to go home happy. And that was drawn in my mind. That was to see. And I mean, with Genesis, some, those dates were 150,000 people outside. We played Nedworth. I mean, to see those people enjoy themselves. And and some of the the other the other the police was amazing that you know they weren't just jumping on stage they were jumping up in the audience and um, it didn't matter how bad sometimes the band was on stage or musically they were bad because they were jumping up and police weren't great live but the you know, sting was all jumping up and down trying to sing he's playing bass at start yeah, amazing and I realised that the performance and the band enjoying them on stage was what it was all about if they're enjoying themselves 
you know the crowd are going to enjoy themselves. And that's a learning thing I, I learned from being on the road. And then you took all of that experience and parlayed that to further your career into a pretty amazing run with um, working as a producer and running your own studio. And again, the roster of artists that you had a chance to to work with over that part of your career was pretty incredible as well. Yeah, I mean, nothing was planned. I had nothing planned. Um, one thing I will say, I was never interested in money. I, I, I had money, shall we say. I always had money. Um, somehow I found money. So money was never it was about enjoyment and, and enjoying my life. And um, I found that if I enjoyed my life and I was good at what I did, the money would follow. And I haven't made as much money and I've given a lot of it away and not really interested. But now I'm, I'm my older, I'm starting to realize that money is quite helpful now. But in those days, money did not motivate me at all. Absolutely not motivated. Uh, it was just enjoying life, traveling the world. I really wanted to travel the world. And that was, this was one of the ways of traveling the world without having to pay for it myself. So I've been, most of the places around the world I've been there. Most of Europe I've been once or twice or three times or whatever. Um, I've flown, I've gone to America every single year, at least once since 1981. I don't know many people can say that. Now, I, 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 go, I fly to America probably four times a year, but I have been every single year, even when the lockdown COVID came, I still managed to travel that the year it, 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 it started, the year it finished. I never, I've never missed a year not being in America. So that, that's quite something for me. Do you ever just sort of every once in a while, take a step back, look back on your life and all of the, the things you've done and the people that you've worked with and the places you've gone and think, holy shit, this is, this is a bizarre life that I've led. I never look at it because I forget about what I've done sometimes. It, it, you, you're, you, you doing things have actually made me write stuff down. I thought, oh, did I, did I do that? I did that and that. Um, I forget things. But I do know I've had a wonderful life um, doing what I, what I do. Don't, don't believe for one moment there's no stress in what I do. I've had a couple of strokes and that hasn't helped. And, um, and that's because of the show in Vegas. It's been very stressful when it started out. And I was traveling a lot and I had a family here and it was hard work until I moved to America. But um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ch change anything. I, I don't think I'd change anything. I, I've I had a lovely time, traveled, and been really interested in traveling. I love that, meeting people, you know. So it, it's, it's, it's really been an interesting life, yeah. And there are not many people, I can tell you, not many people in the world, let alone in the UK, that have done what I've done. I mean, I've been in a band. I've, to I've, I've tour managed. I've managed. I've run studios. I've owned studios. I've produced records. No, uh, nobody has done that. People Often people are incredibly good at their job, but they're a tour manager or they're a manager. But I've done the whole lot. The very few. I've run a publishing company. A very successful one. There are very few with the, with the round knowledge I have and to end up in Vegas, I had no idea or plan or wanted to go be in Vegas. Never planned to be in Vegas. So it, I, I've been very lucky, very, very lucky. Definitely want to talk about the show in Vegas, Raiding the Rock Vault. I mean, this is a, a, a huge show and it's a big undertaking. And if anybody has seen the show, they're aware of how amazing this show is. How did the idea for Raiding the Rock Vault come to be? Where did the concept come from? It came from a, a drunk partner um my old business partner simon napier bell you may know the, the character he came to me in 2012 i'd just been out on tour with a girl called Hayley westrid i managed a, a, an opera singer an italian opera singer and um we were touring with her and we did some theater did about five theaters and one night we were at the pier, pier end in margate or something and i went out to get fish and chips and I walked down the side of this theatre and it was the bootleg Beatles and the Fleetwood Backs and the Australian Pink Floyds. And they were doing like 20, 30 shows. I thought, bloody hell, this girl sold five million records and we're doing five shows. What the hell's going on? Um, and then si about three months, four months later, it was a Christmas. We were, I met him at the Hilton in Kensington and he came up with this idea that he'd been to, looking around India for a, to break a... A West, an Eastern act, you know, whether it's Australian or Japanese or whatever. And he'd gone to this bar in um, 
India somewhere, drunk on champagne, and he went, he heard this great band, and uh, he said, uh, absolutely exceptional. He thought it was a DJ, and he went for a pee, and he went right past them. He thought it was a DJ, and there they were, absolutely amazing band indeed playing it. And he came back to me and said, what about putting uh, a genre of music played by the best band there could possibly be? Because he said, I I've seen these bands, the, the bootleg Beatles or the Rolling Bones, they're not normally very nice. I said, I saw the Australian Floyd the other day, they're fucking crap, awful, crap, awful band. Now, I, honestly, when you work with the Floyd and you work with these people, they weren't good. And I said, I think you've got something, but the idea of you is has never been done before. You, it's always about a band. But it, it, he said, but yeah, yeah, but if you pick a genre of music and pick all the songs of that genre of music that have been the big hits, the big number ones, then everybody will know them because they played at weddings. What would you go for? I said, well, I suppose at the moment I'd go for the, the classic rock because that's what I'm after Asia and stuff like that. That's what I've been doing. Although I was doing classical music at the time. But um, I think that could work. So I went to see a couple of friends of mine, a uh, promoter, Steve Parker, who ran the agency, um, one of which was, was bought by UTA. And he said, oh, it's a good idea, but he said, nobody will ever get it. No, I don't understand it. You have to make a poster up. And I put a poster together. And he said, well, I don't really understand that. I said, well, what do I do then? He said, I got no idea. But it's a good idea. So um, I then phoned a friend of mine and said, if I pick the best classic songs there are, it, it, as I see it, or Simon sees it, what about you record it? And then I rang up a friend of mine and then rang up somebody else. And we ended up recording 30 songs in a studio in LA with Simon Phillips, the drummer. And um, and with all these great players on it, really good, great players on it. Then I thought, what do I do now? I've got these, these great songs, what do I do that? So I thought, I'll put together a band and we'll play one off show and we'll film it. And then these arseholes don't get it and they're blind, deaf and dumb. And so I did, I did, I did a show in LA with quite some of the people who were in the, in the show um, were in the band that recorded it. Some other people came, all, all names like Howard Leeds and what. And so we put a really good band together. So we had the names and we had the show in the, and we filmed it properly, proper filming. And then Wendy Dio said, I think the Hilton would like that in Vegas. And then somebody else said, I think the, bit, the, the Hilton would love that. And that's, we end up going, on the way back to England, I went by um, Vegas, stopped at the Hilton, met these two chaps, elderly guys, they were, they were young, and they showed me the stage with that, with it, where um, um, Elvis played and all this sort of stuff. And I said to this guy, I said, Rick, um, who makes the decisions around here? And Rick said, I do. Well, let's go up to the office and, and we'll talk about it. And I went up to his office and he offered me a deal. <laughs> out of the blue. And, I, and then he said, if you can get this together to, to launch in March, then we've got a deal. And that's what happened. That's, that's the story of how it, how it happened. It wasn't meant to be. The idea was to tour it. The agency at that time, the, the guy, I can't remember his name now, but he was ran it from New York. He was interested in the idea, saw the video and all that. But um, and then I thought, well, I've got a home now. I've got a home and we'll build it. And I went to see a couple of big, really big players, Irving Azoff and people like that. And they said, if you can break it in Vegas and people go home from Vegas and talk about it, then you can probably tour it. That would be an easy way to tour it. A bit like they did with Motley Crue. You know, Motley Crue were dead and buried. They did a re residency at the Hard Rock. And everybody goes home and says, oh, I saw them, the drummer going around and singing and all that. And, and then suddenly Motley Crue were touring and sold out. So I thought, well, that's, that's the way we'll do it. After the break, Sir Harry shares some of the incredible tracks that guests of the show will hear performed. And we talk about the longevity that Raiding the Rock Vault has enjoyed in Las Vegas. That's next on Jeff Does Vegas. Something I think a lot of people might not realize about this show is the longevity. Uh, Raiding the Rock Vault has been on the Vegas Strip at multiple different resorts over the last several years. And I know, like I personally, I have been doing trips to Vegas pretty frequently for the last seven or eight years. And I can't remember a time when I haven't seen billboards for Raiding the Rock Vault. The other thing is absolutely great. 
I love this one, but it's true. We played the Hilton, or it was called the the LVH, like Las Vegas Hilton. It stood for whatever. Um, and it was sold to Westgate. And then we went to the um, we went to the Tropicana. Tropicana was sold. And then we went to the Hard Rock. And the Hard Rock was sold. <laughs> so we've left every hotel being sold. I wish I'd done the deal with, with whoever bought the hotel that I get the cut of the action. But yeah, we were the most moved show in, in Vegas as well. Apart from winning the best of Las Vegas eight years, which no, nobody else has done more than three, I think. We've done it eight years in a row. Um, and I'll tell you something, it goes back to what I said earlier on. And it's really, really digs deep. People come up to me after the show. They don't have, often know who I am. Um, I don't go on the show. Oh, I'm sorry, it's my show. They come up to me and say, you, you're the producer of the show. And I say, yeah, that's one of the best evenings I've ever had. And that goes back to what Ozzy said all that years ago. That, and that, even if I'm losing money, I feel, if nothing else, that, that those people have come in. And I can tell you that some of those songs would have been when they got divorced or maybe terrible things happened to them. The boyfriend left them or they lost their job or whatever but they have happy memories for some reason. And that, that 90 minutes has made them happy. They go home happy. And that's why we have a fan base that we've never had. No other show has it. We have more five-star reviews than any other show ever in Vegas. Celine Dion, Rod Stewart, anything. Can't come anywhere near us. Those people love the show. Even though I, was, I was checking TripAdvisor the other day. There's five new things, four or five stars. It's unbelievable. And I think the really cool thing about the music that's being performed in Raiding the Rock Vault is it's music that is universally enjoyed in that it's being enjoyed by everybody from kids who are just discovering the music to uh, people who were around when the music first came out. It's it really is amazing, isn't it? In, I'd say so in America. I may not say around all the world. Um when we came to England, we did change it slightly to make it more songs that were big, because some songs were big in America, weren't necessarily big over here. But as, as a rule, yes, I mean, in America, long may it last, it won't last forever, but classic rock still, you know, when you go to a petrol station or a gas station or a shopping market, you know, normally you don't hear hip, hippity hop, you hear classic rock normally. So it, it's, it's part of your life, part of your lifestyle. It isn't part of our last lifestyle. I want to talk a little bit about the lineup of performers that you've got for this show, because it, it really is incredible. People need to realize that rating the rock vault is not a, a tribute show. This is not a show of impersonators. And, and I don't want to crap on any of those impersonators or tribute bands because some of them are, are really, really incredible. But the people that you've got performing in this show are legit world-class rock stars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that was always the idea. And, and it was always the idea if they, if they misbehave, they get fired, yeah, um, bringing other people in when they, when they were touring. As well. so, I, so it is that never, you never know who's going to be in the room. And, and I never tell people, because I won't do that, when people write in who's in the show t- you know, on Tuesday, I don't really tell them. I say they, it could, they could be in, but we never guarantee till the day off. Because especially with COVID, it's all, it's all over the place. So, um, that things change, and that's what's exciting, you know. Oh, I, oh, I, who did you see um, playing that? Oh, I saw Doug Aldridge, but no, I saw, I, I saw him. It, people, and they want to come back and see it again. It encourages people, you know, and that's what, and and the, encourages the band. The band are playing with different people as well. I mean, Dave Amato, I always thought Dave Amato for air supply. Why would he want to come in, you know? Um, and he enjoys it because he's been playing his old shit song for years, 18 years. And some of the songs are quite difficult to play for him. You know, he, he doesn't find it easy, that easy. And he, he, he finds it a challenge and different. He loves, loves being it. He'll come in for a couple of weeks, no more. He's got things to do, but he, he enjoys it. And that's lovely to have him in the room, you know. Um, Doug, um, and, and Doug from uh, White Stake and all, and all sorts of people here, yeah. yeah. Do you just have like a Rolodex of names that you can just call when you need somebody to be a part of the show? Is that how it works? You just pick up the phone and call whoever and say, hey, uh, I need you to be a part of Raiding the Rock Vault this week. Can you get to Vegas? No, I'm not. I, I, I'd like to say I do, but I don't. Um, no, I do have. I do know a few people, but it's normally the people who are in the show that say, 
why don't we get him in? Or I'll, I'll ask him. I mean, like, for instance, we got um, our drummer at the moment is Blas Elias, who's in the uh, Trans Iberian Orchestra. And uh, my girl, was in, my, one of my singers, was in an accident recently, and she's at the show. So I thought, oh my God, we're opening the show up. We've got those singer. And he said, why don't we try Georgia from, she's in, in the show, and she's English. And, I, and I've seen the Trans Iberian Orchestra. And I know what she looks like. She looks great. She's a real group. She's been in another uh, 10 years. And so we called her up. She came down and I said hello to her and interviewed her. And she's in the show now, you know. So it, it, it's, it's word of mouth. You know, people get out. And, and people, are, and then to be honest, quite a lot of people c- come to me and say, I'd like to be in the show. I pay really well. Um, that's my problem. If, if things go wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm not like, a proper covers band, if you get 150 pounds an hour or 100 quid a shot, I pay a lot more than that. So they've got to be good. They, although I can't have them on. They've got to have some sort of noteworthy. And it doesn't matter how good they are, they haven't got some noteworthy name. They've been played in this band, they can't be in it. That's, that's the deal. Every now and then I'll put somebody that's maybe not, because I'm called out, because especially at the moment, everybody's out on the road that I'm trying to get the money out. So it's uh, July, normally it's September, I'm um, I'll be back again, but July and August are really hard. That's when all the classic rock acts are going out as packages, and it's difficult to get anybody in the band. But so far, I've survived. Anyway. But um, yeah, it's it, it's it, I just thought it's exciting, you know. Could you run through some of the tracks that uh, that are performed in this show? Because I mean, again, it's it's classic rock. It's very familiar music. It's music that I think pretty much everybody knows. They they've heard it at some point in their lives. But what are some of the big ones that uh, that the band performs? We start off with uh, something. What we start with, we've obviously got the Who, my generation, Jimi Hendrix. So we're working through from the sixties onwards. And trust me, I. I I'm, I'm a bit lost, but we've got everybody. We end up with ACDC and Van Halen. We've got a Foreigner song in there. We've got a Journey song in there. So as we run along, we've got um, then we have a couple of medleys. medleys. We've got the Floyd. And we've got um, we had Supertramp once early days. Um, I'm trying to think, and, and uh, Boston. Uh, uh, you know, uh, not, so we've got quite a few of them. They're, they're all, and they do change every now and then as well. You know, we put a Rolling Stone in there now, um, which is a duet girl. The only duet the Rolling Stones ever did, Give Me Shelter. Um, so we do change things up a little bit. Just to, And uh, every time we hit a particular period, we'll say to people, here are the 10 songs we don't have anymore. Vote for the one you want to be in the encore. We never do an encore, ever do an encore. When we hit the 500 show, the 1,000 show, the one that we'll, we'll do something special on that night. You know? But they're all there. It, it all changes. Um, um, trying to think who else we got. Hendrix. I, I don't know what we. Are. I, I can't really remember. It's, but, but all the, all the, the, the you never make everyone really happy. People say, "Why haven't we got the Kiss song?" Well, we haven't got the Kiss song because I don't think people think Kiss is the biggest band in the world. They may be, but in the in Europe, they're not necessarily well known. And we try to have the well known songs that are not just rock. They're the ones that have been number one in the Billboard Contemporary Charts. That's the winner. So that everybody who's not necessarily into hard rock or into classic rock or into into country, well, they know those songs because they were number one in the crossover charts. You know, So that's what we try and do. You mentioned some of the resorts and hotels that Rating the Rock Vault has been at over the past uh, several years in Vegas. You've been at the Westgate or the LVH, as it was at the time. You've been at the Tropicana. You've been at the Hard Rock. Now, here it is, 2022. You guys have moved to another hotel and another new venue. Um, You are now off the strip at the Rio in a brand new spot called the Duomo. Um, What's it been like moving into this new venue and, and being able to open a brand new venue? Mm, bit of a nightmare, really. We were supposed to go in and um, start in March, um, and they had lots of problems. It was a brand new space that that, that my, my friend Tony had, had, had. I wanted to try and be in a venue with three hundred people, which is what we had with the the Hard Rock, the vinyl, the vinyl room there, and it worked for us. It worked for them, and it worked for us. And his smaller club only had two hundred, and it was really tightly fit. So he. I said, why don't you go for the room that Chippendales have got? Chippendales had just left the Rio. And then they, uh, Caesars 
got rid of a load of shows and everything, decided to get out of it, entertainment as we know it. And um, they came back, unfortunately, and took over the old room. They couldn't get a room anywhere else. So Tony found this area near the Kiss area on, on down floor and thought it was a restaurant beforehand, um, like a bit like Benny Harner's type thing. And uh, so it's got a very low ceiling, which is not perfect, but we got around it. And he rebuilt it. They built it out. They built it into a 300-seater venue, a wonderful, nice bar, and a Italian pizza-type place. So that's all part of this whole venue. And, and, and it's lovely. It's new. It was a bit of a headache because we, we were, they were running late. They couldn't get permission for this and that. The, you know, the normal thing, oh, council wouldn't take this. The Nevada was saying, no, you can't do that. The step's too bloody high and not low enough. But it went on and on and on. But eventually we got in there. Three months later, I wanted to get in there. Um, but we got in there. Everything was new. We had to build a new stage. Um, we had put a PA system in there, a lighting system. So it was a lot of work. But we got a room that we, we like, we love and like. And it works for us. We were there putting it together. My team, who have been with me for pretty eight or nine years now, probably 10, um, put the whole thing together. We've got, there'll be a show before us uh, in September at six o'clock. We'll be at eight o'clock and there'll be a show after us. So it, it, it's, it's nice. It's got a nice feel. The Rio is, uh, I like the hotel, but it needs a bit of love. And I think it's, it's getting the love it's going to get. They're already working on it already. They were very, Amenable, not to me, but to Tony, who took over the space. The new ownership were very good to him. They want to create something in that area, which is the old carnival area, uh, which is dead as a donut now. Um, and so slowly, it's becoming a bit alive there. You know? so, so, yeah, it works for us. And to be honest, it's not about the hotel. The show is good. If people want to see the show within reason, they'll go and see it anywhere. They'll go and see it anywhere. So I've never been worried about, I mean, Nobody went to, to the hard. No, hardly anybody stayed at the hard rock at the end of the day. It was, it was Dennis Dodo as well. But um, people went to see the, to come see us, and they'd come and see us. That's fine. We didn't have a lot of people staying in the hotel. We didn't have that. Like we're off the strip. Um, same with Tropicana. There was no reason to go to the Tropicana at all. Nobody went. Nobody went. They they put a, a restaurant in there, um, run by a, a, something Irving Irvin or something it's called um, English Scottish guy a chef. Nobody goes there. Nobody goes there at all. If you've got a good show, they go there. And that's what the Hilton realised, the people who ran the LVH, they realised um, that we pulled people in. And to have a billboard, number one show in Las Vegas, two years or three years, at the LVH meant, meant something good to them. It helped them. So that's what we needed to find people who understood the show, brought people in, made people happy, and they spent money. Our people have money. They spend it, they buy drinks, they gamble. We know that, we know that. They spend money on food. They may not stay in the hotel, but I know quite a few people stay at the Rio. So it works for everybody. Everybody, I don't care about money. If I make money and the hotel make money, we're all happy. As long as we all make money, we're all happy. Well, as I say, I can't remember a, a time on any of my recent trips to Vegas when I haven't been leaving the airport and seen a billboard or a cab sign or a digital billboard or something advertising rating the rock vault so obviously you, you guys are doing something right it's it's working it works it works what i've done is one of the things i've learned from the very beginning was that it, coming into vegas was a big spend uh, everybody tried to smother me rock of ages tried to close me down they doubled their spend at radio and everybody tried to close me down people gave me three months well it got it slightly wrong and <laughs> and um i worked out from from learning, not, not because I, I, I'm clever, it's because I don't know Vegas, but learning that if I keep the show going long enough and people going back and telling people, it's the same idea that Motley Cooper had, coming back and saying, oh, you go to Vegas, that show rock, rock, Rain in the Rock, well, you've got to go and see it. And people wrote that on TripAdvisor, I could stay, and that's why we're there. That's why. Um, people love us, and they enjoy it, have a great night, and they tell the whole world, and you can't buy that. That's, if you want to, you know, if you want to have a good restaurant, You've got to have good service, look after people. If I see a bad review and I th think I've upset somebody or given them a rubbish night, I I'll approach them and I'll say, look, you can have your money back. Why do you, why, what? we had a one star review once, well, first one ever, and we never once since on TripAdvisor. And the girl said, oh, I didn't like the show anymore. 
I thought I've ruined the night. I can't, I can't live with that. So I wrote to her and I said, I want to give you your money back. Please explain to me why I ruined your night or why you're not happy with us. You need to give us a one star review. We've never had one. Always get five stars or four. And she said, well, I can't see Doug and I can't see um, someone else. Oh, I came to see Hugh McDonald. And I said, well, Hugh's out with Bon Jovi, so I couldn't have him. Doug's just had a baby. Well, he and his wife's had a baby, and, and he got California. And she was at the and she got to see those two people particularly. And she thought, I said, they've done six years on the hit playing. I said, you come one night. And she said, oh, I thought it was one-off gig. I said, no, it's not one-off gig. They're just... <laughs> and she, she said, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean that. And she wrote five-star review. And... Uh, and that and that made me feel happy that I hadn't ruined a night yeah, because that uh, awful. She paid fifty dollars and I ru- ruined a night, but she didn't realise she thought it was a one-off thing. And they, you know, it wasn't. We do five nights a week, you know. Like, once uh, once she knew the story, she was happy. Sir Harry Cowell, thank you once again for taking the time to jump on and uh, have a conversation uh, about rating the Rock Vault and sharing the story of the show. I, I really do appreciate it and looking forward to checking out rating the Rock Vault on an upcoming trip to Vegas. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. For tickets and info on rating the Rock Vault, visit ratingtherockvault.com. Also, be sure to follow them on Facebook at Rating the Rock Vault and on Twitter and Instagram at Rock underscore Vault. Of course, as always, you can find these links in the show notes at JeffDoesVegas.com. And that wraps up another episode of Jeff Does Vegas. If you've got feedback on this episode of the show or any other episode for that matter, or you've got suggestions and ideas for topics you'd like me to cover on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to me via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Jeff Does Vegas. Or drop me an email directly at Jeff at Jeff Does Vegas dot com. In the meantime, thank you so much for checking out the show. Be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll know the moment new episodes are available. And don't forget to visit JeffDoesVegas.com for past episodes and show notes. My name is Jeff, and this has been Jeff Does Vegas, a Walker New Media production. Walker New Media.